Okay, so uh, today's lecture will be on uh, graphical user interfaces in Python and how you design them. And we are going to use a special library called PyQt to do this. Uh, yeah. Yes, so quite cute. Uh, so first a little bit overview of user interface on different platforms. So I'm not going to involve mobile phones and uh, smartphones. So we are going to kind of limit ourselves to the desktop. And on the desktop, we have uh, three major operating systems. We have Linux, we have Windows, and we have Mac OS. And if you want to uh, develop user interface on these platforms, uh, you have to program to certain libraries. So for example, in uh, on Linux, there is X11 or Wayland as a uh, library that you use uh, code your user interface is on. on. On Windows, we have two major libraries, one called Win32 and one called WinRT. Um, and on Mac, you have UIKit and NSKit to implement your libraries. So you can see here already that you need one application compiled with different source code for each of the different platforms, which is a bit complicated if you want to support multi-platform applications. So what we can do instead is to use another library that covers all these toolkits. And one of those libraries is Qt. We you have already seen one of those applications uh, in Paraview. So Paraview is implemented in Qt. Uh, it's a C++ library. Um, so, but it hides the, the complexities of different platforms in a single library. So uh, you only have to write one single source code to implement your applications on, on all platforms. You have to recompile for your platform, but it's the same source code. Uh, on top of that, we if you are in, want to code in Python, there are something called a binding and that is a python binary module that interfaces with uh, c++ or fortran or any compiled language library and provides a python interface for that so pyqt is one of them and the benefits of this is that you can code a single application with a single source code file and you can support them on on all platforms and an advantage of python is that you actually don't have to recompile you can just run your source code on every platform. So Qt, uh, it's a platform independent user interface library. Uh, it has a long history. Um, it was developed in early, late 90s, 2000, uh, as a commercial library from the beginning. And um, later it uh, became open source. So for um, uh, so for Linux, you can actually use this if you do, uh, uh, you're do using an open source license, you can use this for free. And the desktop environments today, actually one of them at least, the, the KDE desktop environment on Linux is based on Qt. So the KDE development library basis has this foundation, the Qt library. Uh, today you can use Qt on Windows and Mac as well for free if you um, don't sell it commercially. So they have a commercial license as well that you can buy to if you want to develop commercially. And as I said before, it abstracts all user interface concept in a single library. So there is no need to call native functions for any platforms. Uh, and also one, one of the nice things with Qt is that actually it adapts to the user interface of the platform you're developing on. So for example, if you develop on Windows, it looks like a Windows application. If you develop for, um, Mac, it looks like a Mac application. There are other user interface libraries that use the least common as they, they have the same user interface on all platforms, which makes the application stand out a bit that it's not designed for your platform. Um, you can also apply styles for your user interfaces. So you can give your user interface a custom look. So if you are not satisfied with the Mac OS or Windows or Linux look, you can uh, adapt the user interface for that. And also <clears throat> things happening in, in the user interface is handled through something called signals and slots. 
And you, it's similar to what you, you can take a cable and connect it from a button to a, a method. Um, and that is the kind of sense of signal through that, that wire. Yes. Uh -huh. um, yeah, as I said before, Qt is a C++ library. Uh, and using Qt from Python requires a binding. And you will see this binding in many cases. For example, NumPy uh, is a binding to a C library for array computing. Uh, there is also other bindings that provide conduits to um, C or C++ or Fortran-based libraries and pro uh, to provide a way of using them in Python. The unfortunate thing with Qt is that there are several uh, different versions of the library. So there are PyQt6, PyQt5, PyQt4, and there is Qt for Python, which formerly was called PySide, and Python Qt. And uh, we are in this course, we are going to focus on PyQt5. PyQt6 is a bit still uh, in development, uh, not development, but it's uh, too few libraries that support it. Um, so, something that we need to cover uh, uh, when we develop user interfaces, it has a different programming model than normal normal applications, uh, computational applications. So, uh, most of the Qt or user interface uh, applications are centered around something called an event loop. And an event loop is a loop that waits for messages from the operating system. Uh, to do things. So messaging could be a uh, user presses the key on, on the keyboard, uh, moves the mouse, clicks the mouse on some location of your application. It can be system messages coming from the operating system, not so usual, but still, it's, for example, if, if you uh, resize the window, there's a message okay that tells your application the window was resized. Um, and the event loop also dispatches the messages to code that handles the event. So most of these systems require you to do things when certain things happen. Otherwise, the, the window goes blank. And the loop exists until the last window has been closed. So an example of a pseudocode for an event loop looks like this. So you have a, a flag, running is true. And then we have a while loop here. So while we are running, we check for an event. Uh, if there is an event, for example, a button click, we delegate the handling of that event to something. So handle button click. Then you have a lot of if statements here to check for different events. And as, as finally, we get an event called app quit. So that the user wants to quit the application. Then we stop here, you set the flag to false, and then the while loop exits and the application terminates. So user interface application will stay in this loop forever until the last window has been closed the loop will check for events and do things. So uh, it will sit, wait. Uh, it doesn't do anything until you, the user, does something with the application. Um, yeah, so there are many bindings in Qt. So which library to choose? It's a hard question because it's not so easy. Uh, and also it makes, because there are different Python bindings and they have different namespaces, uh, when you code, it's really, if you put PyQt in your code, it will use PyQt. It will not use anything else. So we need to find a solution for it. And, and there is actually a way of doing this. There is a special module called QtPy, <laughs> which is a module that checks for the installed Qt bindings in your um, environment and imports the correct modules. So regardless of which uh, Python, by, Python binding you have installed, QtPy can ch choose the one to use. And you can use a single source code for any of the Python bindings of this. Um, so this is a, a typical a small a main program or event loop in uh, actually the smallest Qt program you can write. So here you have, you import, uh, this is just Python, uh, modules, then you do from QtPy, Qt widgets. Qt widgets is the main sub-library of Qt for providing functionality such as uh, windows, buttons, and so on. And we import everything here. We have our main program here. And 
The first thing we do when we start a Qt application, we create an application object. The application object is what owns your application and all the windows uh, for that. And the first thing we do is we initialize it with the uh, arguments from the command line here. So the reason we do this is that there are switches you can apply to your, when you start a uh, Qt application for controlling things. So we pass the, the arguments along to the application. So next we need to create some kind of interface to the, to the user. And this one simple thing is to create something called a widget. And a widget is a, a control or something you can interact with. And by default, it's a, if you don't give it an owner, it will be a window. So here we create a QWidget object. And to be able to show it on the screen, we need to uh, call the show method on the widget method here. And if we have run the program now, it will just show a window and lock up. Nothing will happen. So to make it run, we need to go into the application loop. And the application loop in, in Qt is the app.exec method here. And the underscore is should be there because exec is a, another method in Python that we don't want to interfere with. So they have added exec here. This will enter the Qt application loop. So basically, we start spinning here, waiting for events. Uh, and then this exit here is just that if it application loop uh, terminates, if everything is okay, it returns zero, and we pass that along to the application to exit with a zero return code. You could just run it without this as well, but this is kind of the basic way of doing it. So I will try to do it interactive here. So let's go to ex1. So this is uh, the application in just do the code. Um, so here you have a bit more information here, but or, yeah. okay, there's a bit more information here. That's, so show here is important, uh, and here you can see before application loop that prints out on the screen just to show what, what happens when they run the application. So let's see here. So you see here, we got the window and you can see here before application loop is highlighted here. And the last statement here hasn't occurred yet. So if I close the window here, you can see here, okay, it didn't even, it should have printed out the last one here, but it, apparently it's, okay, we do. Probably because it terminates here. Yeah, so the last window closed and it exits here. And this show here, we show the window. So QWidget is, a, is the base class of all uh, user interface objects in Qt. And if you don't give it a, um, if you just instantiate QWidget, it will just uh, show an empty window. And the widget itself can contain other user interface objects. You can add buttons, you can add controls to this window, uh, and it will own those um, controls. You can also, if you if you want to create your own application, you can, that this kind of without menus, you can create derive a custom application from this Q widget. So you will create your own class that inherits from Q widget. Just to kind of illustrate um, the object structure or the class hierarchy in, in, in um, Qt, you can see here you have Q widget on top here. And here we have uh, created our own window class that inherits from Q widget. So all the functionality of Q widgets is part of my window here. And here you can see we add controls to this window. We can have groups here as well with multiple controls in it. I will show you later here. But so here you can see how uh, object orientation comes in in this here. So most of these controls inherit from Q widget. So all the functionality from from uh, Q widget is here as well, and it knows how to display itself. It knows how to position itself in a, in a window and so on. So here is an example here of uh, 
uh, window class that we have defined ourselves. So uh, my window here, and I inherit from QWidget. In my constructor here, I call the init method of QWidget. And I usually put all the user interface code in a separate routine here, so init GUI. And we put uh, the, the, the user interface initialization here in a separate window here. You can see here I set geometry here, which sets the, the uh, window size. We can set the title here, and then we can display our window. Here you can see we have init GUI, uh, we have our uh, class initialization here, and we run our, our window. So now we, if we run this, the window should get its own. You see it changed size here to 600 by 600, and we got the title here, my window. So QWidget has code for actually handling how the window resizes. That, that, that behavior you don't have to implement uh, because the Q widget itself knows how to move it, move the window, change the size, set the title and so on. Uh, the main program then becomes this. So you, as before you set application, uh, create an application object and we instantiate our own window here. And as I put show here in the end here of init GUI, we don't have to do show here. We can just instantiate the window. Uh, so uh, empty window is kind of useless as a user interface. So uh, what we are going to do now is add some things to it. So one obvious thing is to create a button. And what we do here is we we create self button equals a push button. That, we, that, that push button is the class we want to create. And we assign it to this button here. And one thing is if you want to have a, a, be able to modify the user interface controls, you need to attach them to as an attribute to your class. If you just put button here, yeah, it will create a button, add it to your window, but you can't access it afterward. You can't, if you press a button, there's no way of accessing it because it's only uh, owned by the window. So what we do here, everything that you want to modify in user interface should have self dot here in front of it so we can access it. And here you can see the first parameter here is the text of the button. Self here is the owner of the button. So in this case, the owner will be my window. So you attach the button to my window. Then we can set a tooltip. That is what happens when you hover with the mouse over a button. It will display a message here. We can set the size of the widget here to uh, 100, 50 here with the resize method. And then we can move it to 50 by 50 uh, x, y. And coordinate system in the window is 0, 0 on, on the top left and positive down. So you can see here that there is a button here. And you can see already here that the button knows how to display itself. It knows uh, that it should display uh, text when you hover over it. Uh, and if you press it here, uh, no, uh, something should happen. So this is the user interface here. So you can see if you run it on a Windows machine, it will look like Windows. If you run it on a Mac, it will produce a, a Mac button here. So now the button has not been connected. So to connect the button to something that oh, you want to do something in your code, you want to run your calculation, for example, you need to handle the event when the user clicks the button. And that is handled through these events and signals. So. Every control in Qt has several signals it can send. And the signals are properties attached to the, the object. So in this case, my button here has a signal called dot clicked, pressed. So when the button is held down and the list box could have a current row changed signal that is sent when the list box has changed. Uh, you can connect to these uh, signals uh, using the connect method. So you have first which signal, so in this case dot clicked and dot connect to connect 
that signal to a method. So in this case here, we connect to on my button click. This is a method that you define in your window yourself. So let's see here, we can. So you can see here, I have a push button here and I want something to happen when I click the, the, the button. So I do button, clicked, connect. And then I have a method here in my um, clouds here. So you can see I have on button clicked self. And then I print out here the information, just a message box here. Uh, and I also have a line edit here to where you can enter text. So if you run this, it's a bit small, but you can see that there is a text box here. I can enter text here. I will go through the controls more detail later. And then you have press me. And you can see here, now it executed a method, the code that was in the on button clicked. It also get, got the, the, the string I put there. Yeah. So this is the signal. This is the method to connect the signal to a method. And here you have line edit. So you can see here, I there is a text method here that you can return the current text in the control. And we display that on the screen. Uh, there's a lot of information uh, available uh, on, online here. So you, here is a few widgets here. So if you click on this, So we go to Q widget. So these are all the clauses that are built into QT. And here you have uh, all the properties of a Q, generic Q widget derived control, uh, public function. But you can also see if you scroll down signals here. Here are signals you can connect. So if we go back here to uh, search for Q button. Push button, okay. Um, and we scroll down here to signals. Okay, well, then show signals. Mm. Now, there is a signal clicked here. But there's a mid, okay, abstract button. Okay, let's derive from this one. Uh, so here you can see the signals that you can send out. Uh, so, it's good to know that these references are, are there. And if you were looking for so, some certain functionality, you can probably go into the control you're working with and see uh, what properties and what method you can call and also which signal it sends. Um, some, some common control properties. So all the widget basically is, imp uh, implements many shared control properties. So one obvious one is the, if the control is visible or not. Then uh, you have a um, set visible, which which can uh, hide it or you can show it. You can also query this using the is visible method. Uh, so this will either show the control or not show the control. There is also one way of showing the control but disabling it. So enabled here will will enable the control, so you can interact with it. If you set it to false. It will be shown, but you can't interact. So it's kind of um, locking the control for interaction. And you can check here is enable as well. Focus is used when you have text text input and you have text box. You have only one have one cursor in most operating system because you have only one keyboard. You can only only type in one location, but you can you can type in different text boxes. And the focus sets the focus of that control to that box. Uh, fonts, you can also set uh, on all controls. 
and also a common way of text control that support text have a method called set text and you can get the text using the method dot text so usually you can see every every uh, property that can, that you can you set it with a set method and you retrieve it with the, the name of the property so it doesn't implement the python property uh, interface here so because this is a c++ library so the methods are mapped from c++ functions so let's see here control mm. So here I have, I create three buttons, uh, all have press me on them. And then we, we have one button one, we connect to on button one clicked and the button two, we connect to on button two clicked. And if we look what happens here. So in this first event method, we uh, check if button two is visible. If it's visible, we set it to invisible by using set visible false. Otherwise, if you click it one more time, we set visible to true. So this basically toggle one button on or off. Then we have uh, is enabled. Then we set enable to false, so disable the control. If we press button two once again, uh, we set enable to true. So this is basically we control the uh, how we can interact with the buttons. So here you can see we have three buttons here. We have press me, press me, and press me. If you press the first one, you can see that the second button disappears. If you press it again, it appears. And if we press the second button here, you can see here that it grays out and I can't press this button. If we click it, I can press the button again. So when you design user interfaces, it's often a good idea uh, to show to the user which which options are available at the current moment so that you that it's there, there's no confusion and, and set enable is one one way of doing that uh, to show that there is an option here but it's not active currently so for example if you haven't uh, if you have a computational code that has an execute method uh, the execute method uh, or the visualization methods are not are only available if the execute uh, the computation has been run successfully and then you can uh, enable that control to show the visualization, for example. Hiding controls is a bit more uh, controversial because then it's no way of knowing that there is a control. I would prefer to have the uh, enable instead. Then you can show that there are controls, but they're not active currently. Um, connect an event, we have already looked at that. Uh, in this one here. Uh, so window style. So uh, we can uh, show windows in different ways in Python, in, in Qt. And what controls that is the when you initialize your window here in the constructor, you can give it an uh, identifier here. So Qt window, for example, that will show a normal window. And then you can modify this here to show I want to have a dialog window. I can have a tool window and tool windows are uh, windows typically for uh, having a lot of uh, like a toolbar that can float around in your application. It has a smaller um, window title bar. It's a bit smaller. And you can see here now this is a bit old Mac here, but it adapts to the style you have on your machine. So if you run this here on my machine, Window style. So let's start with a normal window here. So this is your normal window. You have your minimize win button, maximize, and close. If we instead initialize as a dialog window, You can see here that I don't have a maximize anymore or minimize. Uh, I can still resize here. And also you can see that you have a, a question mark here uh, for help. So that is a standard on Windows that you have a help button here and uh, you have a single crossbar for, for dialog box. And then you have a tool window. 
Now you can see here that you have a smaller title bar here and a smaller uh, box here to close it. It's still uh, resizable. So it fits if you want to have more, many smaller windows with toolbars, you can have a tool window to display those in. It's also a way you can also uh, control how the window should be displayed when you start. So by default, it shows up on a with a fixed size at some the position you design. Uh, but you can also um, tell it to maximize automatically. So for example, here uh, set window state here maximize. That will it's the same thing as pressing the maximize button on the window. So let's start with this one here. So running this, even if the size is 200 by 100, it will. Again. So you can see the window fills up the entire screen. And it, this is the default size. Another option here that is a bit more uh, dangerous is to have um, uh, use the full screen option. And full screen is uh, when you want to create an application that will take over the entire screen. So it could be a information booth or something on a, on a, in a terminal or in a bus station, you don't want the user to be able to access all the other controls. So doing full screen, we'll do like this. So you can see there is no controls, no nothing here. And to exit that, uh, you need to use the Alt F4 button on a, on a Windows machine to close the window. So there is no close button either. Another thing that is very common in many applications is to have a, a, a menu, a menu system. Uh, in in um, Qt, uh, the main class for handling a menu is Q menu bar. And you can have sub menus on that one uh, with Q menus. So th these are the file, edit, um, yeah, and any menus, those are Q menus that you add to a menu bar. And you, on each menu, you can have multiple actions to be. Uh, added to display things. And menus are connected to action object, and the action is a generic connection in the user interface. Um, because in many modern applications, you have menus and you have toolbars. And often the, the functionality of a menu or a toolbar are similar. And the problem is that you don't want to duplicate code. So the idea with actions is that you have an action of your application that does something. And you attach that to to menu or toolbar item in some way. And then in this, the good thing with that is when you click the toolbar, it will call the correct action. And also you put the icons on shortcuts in the action instead of in in the the menus. And then you connect the events to to the action instead of directly to the controls. So let's go to which one was this menu one. So you will you will have access to all this code. You can download it and use it experimentally with yourself. Yourself. So here you have and um, create an action, and here you can also set a shortcut. So basically, um, let's see. Here. Okay, I have a question here. Why do you need to input Qt Core? The the reason for you need to import Qt Core is because the Qt generic identifier interface is, is inside Qt core. So uh, I don't know why, but they put it there. And that's why we need that as well. So some so some some predefined identifiers are in that uh, environment, that module. Uh, okay, so control T, that is a shortcut, meaning that if you press control T on your keyboard, this action will trigger. So not only clicking on the menu, but also clicking on a keyboard will provide this uh, action. And then when you have created action, you have to connect its signal. So the signal of an action is triggered. 
and then you connect that signal to a method here. So in this case, I have on my action here, I just show an interface here. So if we run this, you can see here I have a window here with a file menu, and my action is here. So I can click here, and I get the message. But I can also press Control T on my keyboard, and I get this. So by using actions, you can combine. You can you have a single point where where the functionality of your program is, and then you connect it to menus, toolbars, and shortcuts in a single place. Normal controls like buttons and stuff that you connect using the normal connect. This is only for menus and and, uh, and toolbars. Uh, my toolbar. Uh, okay, more menu. Okay, I have more menu examples here. So, um, yes, toolbar. So toolbars is uh, compl complements the the menus. So um, you add a toolbar to your window here. Uh, so the window. Yeah, as I said, to use menus, I, I forgot about that in the previous example. To use uh, menus, you need to inherit from main window instead of queue widget. So main window is a special version of a, a window that has the ability to have menus and also have toolbars. So if you want to add a toolbar, you call the self add toolbar method with the name of the toolbar, and that returns you an object that you can add your actions to. So in this case, I add my, the same action, but the toolbar instead. So you can see here that I have my action here, my menu here. You can see that I add it using the add menu here. And the, men, the menu bar is the function that returns you the main menu. And then you can add menus to that. I add my action to that. Then I have a toolbar add, and I add the same action to the toolbar. And now you can see here that I have a window with a toolbar. And you can actually move around to this functionality is already, you don't have to code anything for this. This is built in. Uh, and if I press this one here, you can see I get the same mes message here as I have with my action here as well. So this is a, a bit more sophisticated example I have here. Uh, more so the file menus for an editor, for example. Here you can connect icons here to your um, actions. So I can create a queue icon object and I can specify an image and connect that to the file menu. And uh, you can see here I I create um, all the actions first, and then I create my file menu here and add my actions to the file menu. I create a edit a menu here, and I add my actions to that one. Uh, and I create a toolbar and add my actions to the toolbar. So you can see here that I reuse the actions, but I create multiple ways for the user to, to uh, access those actions. So here you can see here I have a toolbar uh, with my methods here. And now you can see it now I have connected every every of these to the same action here. So you can see it displays in the output here of my terminal. Like this. So the thing is that you can also um but here you can see all my methods here to access the application. Uh, layout management. Uh, so there are two ways of 
facing controls on a window. So absolute positioning is what we have done up until now. So basically putting a button and giving its coordinates exactly, and that is where it ends up on the window. Uh, and the second one is something called sizers. And, and the reason we, we need something in addition to absolute positioning is that if you have run an application on a desktop, you can, you can resize the application. And we need to be able to handle that and move controls around. Perhaps that you want to make the controls appear uh, even in the window and move around. Uh, or the controls are hidden when you move the window to small. So using sizers is a way of uh, having an extra function that, that automatically organizes the control in the window and lays them out in a logical way. There are different sizers. So the simplest sizers are the vertical box sizer. And, and the vertical box layout or sizer uh, can control, can handle widgets uh, vertically. And you, what you do is you create your widgets here, and then you just lay, add them to this box layout here. And they will be laid out like this on top of each other. And the, the box layout will make sure that there is a bit of margins between the different controls. It will also, re, when, when you resize the window, it will also move them around. So the, the principle is that you create controls, you create a layout that you attach to your window, add the controls, and then you set the layout of the main window to self V box here. So here we have my buttons here. I add the widgets, set the layout. And if I run this, you can see here, I have four buttons here in my window. And if I drag this window here, you can see here that it will automatically resize the controls to the window here. It looks kind of odd here, but I will show how you can fix that later. So the, 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 the layout class, maintains the organization with controls here automatically. So you don't have to think where the control is placed. The layout will handle that. Uh, and of course, we have a horizontal, a horizontal box layout as well. It, it works the same. You just add your controls, and they will the controls will be spaced out horizontally instead of vertically. So now the controls are horizontally spaced, and uh, you can see it will stretch the controls if, if, if I move the window around. Then you can combine these together. So you can have a layout, for example, with four buttons, uh, four, in four rows, and, and a fifth row is a horizontal spacer. So, uh, vertical layouts can contain other layouts hier hierarchically. So here we have we have our eight buttons now, and I add four buttons to the vertical box layout, uh, and I add four buttons to the horizontal box layout. Uh, then I add the layout, main layout is the vertical box here, and I add the horizontal box to this layout. So this will end up here in the bottom here. What you also can do is that you can add virtual springs to your control. So if you want the buttons not to spread out evenly, you want them to be uh, placed on top, you can do that as well. Uh, then you add, uh, using the add stretch, can also be called add spring, uh, one here, and you will, this will be added to the, to the layout here between the H box and the other buttons here. And that will push the controls um, up and down. So let's see here, HP box. So now you can see I have my four win buttons here and you see I have a spacing here. And if I pull my window down here, you can see here that it will keep the distance here. So you can think of this as a spring that is attached here that will expand and push the controls on top. And then you have my the, the other controls here. And you can see it scales like this.
There's another way of laying out, uh, which is uh, in a grid. And here you have, we have my I have nine buttons here. And we can add them using uh, the grid layout. And here you add widget, but you have two extra options here. And that is just a row and column indicator. So it's not a coordinate, it's just a row and column. So if I want my first button be uh, first row, first column, it will end up here. And below I have two by two. So zero, one, two, and this is two by two. So here you have two, two there. Uh, then you can set uh, margins here uh, and how, so you can see also how I set that the controls here should expand by default. Um, and then you can set margins here, how large the margins should be between different, different uh, controls. You can also set the spacing and you can also set how the different controls should stretch. So um, zero should be no, no stretch, one, one stretch, and then you can also set the relationship between the stretch. So if a, if you put the four, it will be larger. Uh, I think it's better I just show you this instead here. Read layout. So now you can see here that I have uh, my nine buttons here, and you can see I also have a larger stretch here. So this is stretches four times as much as these ones here on the side and also in the height here. Um, and what you can do with this is actually you can have a you can have a grid control and then you can have box sizes here to have uh, additional controls on the left, on the right and, and on top of the window. Um, so this is a my, my recommendation here when you do use it faces do your uh, have a pen and paper or some kind of sketch tool to draw your usage face before you start coding. Because it's very hard, easy to get uh, the controls in the wrong layout and, and they move, move around really chaotically. And uh, so it's good to kind of get your structure down and then code. And then I also will later in this lesson here show you how you can do this interactively using your application. So let, let's take 10 minutes break and then we uh, continue. Okay, let's continue. So uh, I will quickly go through some of the, the controls and also some uh, other functions that can be necessary. Good to know. Let's see if I can connect it to the screen as well. So uh, there are also some some uh, functions in in the user interface or the Qt that can be um, dialog boxes that can be used uh, for common things. So for example, one one di dialog box is the message box to send up a, me a, a informational window that you can the user has to OK to continue. It can be dialogs for selecting files on the on the file system, selecting colors, and so on. So I will just show you here. So uh, this is a message box, uh, informational uh, uh, message box. So on a Mac, it can look something like this. On a Windows, it looks like this. And I will just show it here. So open dialogue, you can see here, you have seen this before. So this is an informational message box. It's just a kind reminder to the user, uh, for example, calculation finished or something like that. You can also do critical, which is a, a, a message box. Uh, for example, if something has gone wrong, you can do, you get this. Uh, and I, I would say that you should be use these sparingly. It's really annoying for users to also, uh, they can be surprised at what didn't happen now. Uh, so for example, when the calculation has finished, you shouldn't post a critical message. Uh, also, it, it is better to be a bit more uh, informational than, than giving all the warning signs. So there is also a warning here that is in between. 
with a warning triangle. So I was I, I used a lot of informational dialogue box. I try to avoid use these warnings unless it's really something critical. Um, another dialogue box is uh, if you want to ask the user a question, for example, there is a question function here in the message box uh, dialogue library where you can add some buttons. So you can ask yes, no, or uh, and also give which is the default. So let's see what happens here. So here you can see you get a message like this. Do you want to uh, erase? Yes or no? And the de default is set, you can set here. So you can see this button has a different color. That is the default one. So if you just press enter here, it will not erase everything. And then you can check here which option was chosen here. So result Q message was yes, and then it does this one. Otherwise, it it's no, and then it does this one here. Uh, another uh, important standard dialog you have is uh, the file menu. So in many cases, you want perhaps the user to select the file that you want to process or work on. And you can do that using the get open file name. So that is uh, picking an existing file name. And here you can have the title here, uh, default file name. And also you can put a filter here, which files to choose. In this case, it says set star dot star. So basically you can choose any files, but you can have a extension here, for example, docx. It will only display Word files, for example. And then you it returns you a file name and another parameter here, which we ignore. So that put an underscore here. So if the file name is not equals to an empty string, the user has made a choice. If the file name is empty, uh, the user has canceled the dialogue. So you can make you can be sure of that if it, if it's empty, no nothing was chosen, and you and if it's non-empty, it will it, the user has chosen a dialogue uh, a file. So let's try it here. File open. And this is the default file dialog on Windows. If you do, do this on a Mac or, or a Linux machine, you will get the same uh, system, or the, the same dialog, but the, the one that you have on a Mac. So if I select a file here and press open, you can see here that you get the entire search path to this file as a return. So it's good thing to know. Uh, it's also possible to uh, let the user select a file that doesn't exist. So for example, if, if you want to create a model and you want to save it, but it, there is no file to save, you can you can use the get save file name to query for a new file name. So now we get a new file dialog and here you can enter a file name, test. And here you're going to see that I, I have a filter here with IMP. So if I don't give any uh, extension here, it will add an extension to the file. So you can see here that you get the search path for the file that the user wants to create. It will also add the extension automatically to the file. And that is what why I have the filter here. So this is a very useful thing. So you don't have to implement the user interface for selecting and uh, selecting files or displaying information for the user. So let's get those here. Go through some controls. So uh, I will just shortly go through some of the controls that, that you can use to build a user interface. So uh, one common one, that, except for the button here, is the checkbox and the radio button. And this, the checkbox is a button with a state. So you can compare it to an on off switch on, on the, uh, in your room. Um, uh, so the checkbox, you can set the check state and you can check the state using the check state function. Uh, the radio button is very similar to the checkbox, but it, um, it's only useful combined with other controls. So if you have three radio buttons, only one of them can be checked at the same time in a, in a single group. 
let's check box. So here I created a checkbox. I have set it uh, checked to true. And I also connected a signal here, which is state changed to connect. So when you change the state of the checkbox, it will call this method. Uh, these controls are not strictly necessary to connect because uh, you can always query the state of that control afterwards. So you don't have to really keep track of it, but you can do it. So you can see a very small checkbox here. I checked it, so now it's checked. This is unchecked. You can see also it's checked like this. So it's either on or off. So it's it could be an option if you want to, in a computational code, you want to have a do this fancy calculation as well, check. And you can have multiple checkboxes to control your behavior of your code. Uh, radio buttons. So so radio buttons has to be combined together. So uh, let's see, I create, I've created two buttons here and I uh, have different connections here. And you can see here, if I click the second one, you can see that the first one was uh, uh, dis disconnected or unselected. Uh, so if I click this one here, it will also go there. So this is a way of, uh, uh, and if you want to have uh, multiple groups of these, so if you if you add a lot of these and you want to have different groups to have uh, for selections, you need to group them using the group control, because otherwise it's only one of these radio buttons or all of them you have created that will have the state or will be checked. Uh, combo box is a multiple selection control, so combined with a text box. So you can give it a certain number of options, and the user can only select these options. And the reason for using this is that if you have a complex user interface, uh, this can hide a lot of options, and, and it takes up a, a not so much space when you use it. Uh, you can you can query the control for which selected item here current index if it's selected it returns zero, uh, something that is from zero and up if it's uh, not selected it's minus one so here you can see you have a combo box it's there is a small indicator on the right that tells you that the user that something uh, can be done here you can press it down and you can see that i have four options here that you can select and you can also query for the text that has been selected so here you can see i have added four items to the control uh, and then i also can i can check uh, connect the signal current index changed to my own method here. And you can check which one was chosen. And you can also query the text here. So the current text of the control is here. But usually you just check if it's one, two, or zero, one, two, three, or something like that in, in your code. Slider uh, is a nice control for giving a more of a unprecise control over some things. Um, it could be, for example, if you want to select a computation model to be fine or coarse, you can have a slider that you can move between options. Um, so here's a slider. It's very hard to see here, but you can move them around here on, on a track. And you have a, a vertical slider and you have a horizontal slider. You create them just like normal controls here. You can set a maximum value and a minimum value, and you can also set the current value here, set value. 
Uh, and then you can connect value change signal. And that will be called every time the control's value has been changed. Uh, so you can see here that I, I print those values out here. List box is similar to the combo box, but you have a number of selectable options. And if you have a lot of options the user can select from a list box is a good alternative. And also uh, if if the items in the text box or list box is not fit, doesn't fit in the visible area, uh, it adds automatically scroll bars to the control. So you can um, the user can scroll in the selection. You can also have multiple selections here in the box. So you can select different items in the list box at the same time. So here we create the list box and we add 100 items to the list box using the add item method here. Uh, you can pre-select using set current row and there is a signal current row changed. And here you can see we have a list box with a lot of values here and you can scroll up and down. And you can see here that I selected here and what, what item it contained. One of the most common controls that we are going to use, or you will use in in, um, in your coding or user interface is line edit. And line edit is, is a simple text box where you can enter values or the user can enter values. You can set the predefined text using set text, and then you can get the text back using the text method. And when you do uh, inputs for your computational code, you usually have a form that the user fills in for certain options. And many of these will be, uh, line edits. So here you can see I have a text box here and you can enter text to this one here and you can query the controls for the input here. So this is what the example I showed in the beginning as well. So you can have multiple of these that have values uh, and you can uh, query those and convert them to floating points and you can go the other way around displaying your values in those controls as well. However, you have to be aware that line edit is a text-based control, so it will doesn't care about floating points. You need to handle the errors for those controls yourself to, to query to see if there are correct values. So um, I'll cover most of the basic controls. So now I want to kind of give you how to handle connecting your model. So your model is your computational model to a user interface. I, I try to separate uh, different things in, in, in my code. So for example, I, I usually add a method called update controls that takes the model values and uh, fills the controls with those value. And then I have another control that gets, goes the other way around to goes to the controls, converts the controls to values that I update my model. So I have kind of just two places, one that goes in one direction, one goes in the other direction. Um, and, and then it's important. I also have a philosophy that I try to, to avoid mixing user interface code with simulation code. So put all your modules for user interface in one module, put your model and your computational code in other modules so that uh, in your computational model, there is no references to QT. Because it could be that next year uh, you want to do a web interface, but then you don't want to have QT references in your code. Uh, you want to be able to have a clear separation from user interface and simulation code. That's why we need to kind of make sure that you, the user interface can, can of course have a reference to your simulation model, but not the other way around. So here is an example here. I have my model here. This is my computation model. I have values that define my model. Uh, and then I have a way of printing out the model here using the, the STR method here. Um, but that's it. So this is the model has no reference to something else here. There is no QT nor nothing. And then I create a user interface like this. And then I go from update controls in my user interface class here, uh, 
So the mod model values goes to the controls here. So here I have text edit, set text, model text value. Uh, so I, I set the text of the controls here, depending on the options of the model. And here I also have to check if it alternative one, two, or three. I check the different boxes here in my user interface, depending on the state of the model. Then I had, have done my computation or, or uh, the user has changed the options in the controls. Now I have to go the other way around. So I have to go, so model text value, I can just populate the text. If it's a floating point value, I need to go from convert the text here because it's a string to floating point value. Uh, same thing if it's checked as a Boolean so that I can assign directly. Uh, and also the value to the value slider is a floating point so I can assign that directly here. And then I also have to uh, set the values here of the alternative in my model depending on if the different controls or the radio buttons are checked. So two methods, update controls, update model. There are some ways that you can't this you can't do it exactly like this, but most of the times you can do it like this. You you have a dialog box with a save and cancel. So save will update the model, cancel will kind of just cancel it. And then when you before you open the control, the, the, the dialog box, you will update the controls with a value from the model. So to illustrate this, I will I will implement a simply supported beam application. So I'm from mechanics, so it will be mechanical examples. But um, so we have a load applied to a beam. And we have a lot of functions here that we want to integrate into the model. So the first thing I, I do is I will, uh, yeah. The idea is that I, I want to have a beam model. So I have a class beam simply supported that has a lot of parameters. I want to be able to set them and I can calculate values here and I can print them out. But now I want to make this into a user interface. So um, I will think I'll do it. So I have my model here. I have uh, default values. Uh, I have functions here for calculating uh, the difference, for example, this is the uh, deflection. And I have my functions here. I have uh, for the section forces, for the moments. And I usually do like this here because uh, it's easier to write formulas with a short name. So instead of writing self underscore A times self underscore B, I just assign them variables here. And because it, it works in Python as reference here, they reference the same value in memory. Uh, one thing I have added here is uh, a way of automatically converting to float without crashing the program. So if a user puts text and you try to convert text to a floating point and it's not a valid floating point number, the program will crash. To avoid that, I, I uh, I created a function here called to float that has new value and old value. So old value is the previous value in the control. This is the new value that the user entered. And here I try to convert it to a floating point. If I get an exception here, I just return the old value. So it's impossible to kind of crash it. If it's wrong, it will not assign it. If it goes through here, it returns the, uh, the converted value here. And here are some uh, get set properties here to get the values here. I have my properties here. Yeah, and this is the model. Uh, then I have a user interface, a beam window. So let's see if I had a picture of that. I want the user interface to look something like this. Uh, text boxes here and an output window here to display the results. So 
in my main window here, beam window, I create uh, a beam object that I contain in my module here. I have implemented it in, uh, as a separate model here. So I have beam model here as a separate module file here. And I import it as BM, so I don't, have, I don't have to type it. So BM, beam simply supported. Initially, I GUI that uh, creates the user interface. Then I call, before I display it on the screen, I call update controls. So I go down to update controls. I set my controls here to uh, the values here. So I, now I go from floating point value to string, and that's no problem. There is no error with that. You can go, you can do that. I also update my text edit here. So the text edit controls here are added. No, oh, sorry, the text edit is the, the display. Here. So I just call clear this control. I append uh, the header, and then I loop over and display. I have an update model here that goes the other way around. Um, and what I do here now, I assigned properties that automatically did. So if we go into the B model here, you can see here, I have a property set E here to and I call to float here. So the cool thing with this is that I can just assign a text to this property that will automatically convert it to floating point without with error checking. So I just do beam A equals to edit text and so on. Also, when a user edits a text box, I update the model and I uh, uh, update controls. So let's run this. So now you can see here, I have a control, uh, the user interface, it's scalable like this. If I change the value here to something else and I switch to another control, it automatically calculates the values here. Mm -hmm. So that's two, three. And you can see here, it updates the control automatically. And I can also, I can push it here and press A here. And you see here, if I press enter here, it will automatically change back to the previous value because it was wrong. So I handle error to try to create a robust, as robust application as I can. So it's very hard to crash this application unless you do some zero yeah, floating point addition I haven't handled, so I could crash it. <laughs> uh, but but text-based input is, is robust. So let's see here. Yeah, so here you can see here, update controls that goes from model to controls and update model goes from controls to the model. So finally, I will uh, introduce a tool that makes your life easier to design your user interfaces. So uh, in Qt can also use um, special description files for defining the user interface. And in the um, in Qt, uh, there is a tool called Designer, or Qt Designer that will that can create these files uh, and you can edit, you can create the user interface completely directively. So let's see if I can start this. So you type designer in the command prompt and it brings up this user interface here. So we can start just doing a single widget here. And you press uh, create. Then you, you get a form window here. And here you can, uh, You have all the controls available here on the left. You can drag drag them in here. And on the top here, you can see the hierarchy of objects here. And you can see here, this the left side here is the name. It will be given in Python. And here you have the class. And here you have, below that, you have the properties of the control. So I can set, for example, the, the text here or the push button. And you can see the text changes here. I can also set the name of the object. 
And so when you save this here, so you can see here that you have test. And you say it's called test UI. So UI is the extension of these files that are called user interface files. Those are, if we open a UI file here, let's say we can find test UI, you can see it's an XML file that describes the user interface. And you can load these files into um, your form. Uh, so here you can see there is a UIC. You add a special uh, module here called UIC, so User Interface Compiler. So User Interface Compiler can load a UI file and attach it to your own window. So the self here is where the object should be attached. So all the objects in the form UI will be attached to the, the, the own window as objects that you created manually as well. So let's see if we can do this here. Um, uh, yes, let's just see. So I will try to create a user interface now and we will save that as a form. So I will do new here. So um, how, how you can think. So what I, I usually do when I start with this here, I, I will just add my controls in some kind of way. I, I want to have them laid out approximately. Don't, don't uh, bother so much with the... Uh, Layout, just put them there in some way. And I want some controls here in the bottom here as well. Drag them down here like this. And then I want to have a control on the in the middle here that is a text editor. So I do a, let's see here. Text edit here like this. So I want this to be able to expand in the middle. So the text here should be the focus. I have a group of buttons here. I have a group of buttons here. So what I then can do is that I can assign layouts to them. So here I, I select these buttons here and I want them to be horizontally laid out. So I can, on the top here, I can set here layout vertically. And you can see here that it's combined them to a single control or group. I do the same thing with these ones here, like that. And these ones here, I want to lay out uh, horizontally, so like this. Uh, then I can see here, okay, uh, these three are belong together in a single row. I have this group with the text edit and, and this one here. So I can select all of them here. And I can say that I want them to be horizontally aligned, like that. And also, I want this top control to be the first row and, the, and this one the second row. So I can select both of these ones here. So I can do this one here. And this one here. And I want them to be vertically a line like this. And then I want them to be organized inside a main window. Now, so the main, so the, now they are placed uh, absolutely in the main window, but I can just add either a horizontal or a vertical uh, layout to the main window. So I ju just do like this, and you can see here that it's centered around, or it's filled up the main window. You can also see here that the layout works like this. So if I want to access a button here, uh, I need to name it, as I said before, so I can access it. So let's see what I have in my code here. I have form UI and I have a self push button one. Uh, so let's push button one. I give it a name. 
And you can see here that I set the text here on the button here to press me. And then I need to save this as form UI like this. I would say save as form UI. And now I can run my application here. So I have main window, Q widget, init GUI, and I load the UI from this file here, which is available here. I set the text of push button one to this here. So if it's loaded correctly, this should change the text of the button to press me. And you can see it's, it took my button here and changed the text. So I didn't have to create any objects in code. I can do the complete design of the user interface in Qt Designer, save it as a UI file and load it in Python. And all the objects here that I created are normal objects in Python now. So you can access them all by name and configure them. And you can see also that the scaling works here like this. But I don't like the, how the buttons are placed here. So I, I would like them to be on top. And I would, would like to have these separated here on, on the le left and right side. So let's go back here. So I saw, said before, I, you can put uh, some springs into the user interface control. And as it happens, there are vertical spacer, horizontal spacer here. Those are springs that you can add to your control. So let's add a spring here in the bottom of this one here. And you can see here that it expanded and pushed all the buttons on top. And you can do the same thing here with that one. And you see it pushes the buttons up. And I want to add some spacing here between here. So I take a horizontal spacer and add it here. And now you can see here that the controls updated. And I press save, go back, and hopefully the user interface will look the same. Oh, yes. So now you can see here I have the push buttons on the left, on the push buttons on the right, and I have those on the top. And you can see if I scale here, you can see that it moves the right buttons to the left because the spring will expand. Same thing with top and bottom here. And you can see there, there is also grid layout, form layout. Uh, and you have all all different controls that you can think of. There are date selectors, time edit, sliders, label. If you want to load images in your user interface, you use the label control. So let's see if we can just do like this and put the label control in between here. So now it says text label here, but you can, with the text label is a bit magical, you can actually um, Pixmap there. So Pixmap is a image. So okay. choose file. So let's take a Python logo like that. So here you can you can load a picture and display it. And if you save this here, it should go into the code as well. And I said the control here is fixed, so it didn't stretch here, so I can't make it smaller. We have to change the properties of the label to make that work. But you can see it loaded an image. So that's Qt Creator. You can see also there are um, uh, OpenGL if you want to do uh, 3D graphics. Uh, there are progress bars. Graphics View is a uh, interactive graphics layout where you can do vector graphics. So there's a lot of things built in here, and it's very easy to to use. Uh, the the designer is is comes as a standalone applications, but if you can't find it uh, download web, you can always download something called Qt Creator which has a built-in form designer as well. So you can use the same tools from that application. So that was my final slide for today. 
there is no uh, seminar this week because I'm traveling. But next week, uh, I will show you uh, some intro on how to do similar things, but web-based. Uh, so Qt is uh, purely for desktop, uh, the Q at least the Qt widget-based uh, applications. Uh, but there is another toolkit for Python that can do web interfaces in the same way, based approximately like we have done today. So any questions or? I have a question here. From... So a question here is, uh, if you have designed a user interface, what is the easy way to distribute the program or code to someone? Uh, of course, Git clone can be an option, but then you need to make sure that all the dependencies are met. Uh, there is also a tool called Py2exe or a Py installer that you can use to uh, create an executable of, of the entire installation. Uh, but if you are work co collaborating, it could be a good idea to create a environment and create a environment description and you send that to someone and they can install the same environment. But if you want a standalone application, you need to use PyInstaller. I, I will look into that and, and um, go through that on a seminar later on. Um, I also have a question, can a label be used to display an image generator from Matplotlib in the same code? Um, there is example, you can integrate Matplotlib into, um, into Qt. I think there is an example in the, the plot, um, in the, the, the distributed code, there is a plot interface where you can integrate uh, Matplotlib into Qt. Uh, it's a bit complicated, but it's it's doable. And I think one of the project assignments, if you if you don't do your own, is one is to create a, um, a graph plotter. No, I, I'm sorry, they, I'm talking. Uh, so in the, the the assignment for Qt, you will have a, a to do a graph plotter where we will integrate Matplotlib into uh, Qt. So that that is doable. Yes. Okay. Otherwise, we stop for today, and um, I will put the lecture out when it's converted to video. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.